and I'm going to share my screen. And while Jude is setting up, um, I would appreciate if people just respond to my email from Friday. If there are any updates, unless we want to talk through it in this meeting, that's fine as well. Uh, but otherwise, asynchronous is okay. And Jude, I, I did just make you the host, so now you should be the host of this meeting. Um, which uh, uh, which email did you use? Oh, I didn't use any email. I just made you the host in Zoom right now. Okay. Yeah, but I, that might not survive uh, for you know f future meetings. I think originally Brittany set up, set up the Zoom, so she should be able to make you host permanently. Got it. Okay, I'll follow up with her then. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the board here. So this is for sprint week of 31 to 33 due, in, uh, due next Monday. Um, let's go ahead and look at the in progress. Uh, Ludo, is this now ready for review, the string implementation? Yes, it is. Excellent. We'll take a look at that today. Cool. Um, I got a lot of things here in review. Um, the, just a bit of an update on where I am with the lockup state for POX. Um, because of how deeply tied the act of locking stacks up is to the act of uh, validating permissions on doing so, um, locking up the stacks as well as implementing the delegation will happen at the same time in the same contract. Um, those are both in progress. I'm writing tests for it right now. Um, the POX contract in total with locking stacks up as well as um, determining the reward set um, as well as implementing delegation lands at about a thousand lines of clarity code. Um, the whole point of this is to ensure that the uh, said contract maintains a data map of all of the potentially stackable um, POX addresses, um, which includes making sure that the only way to get your POX address into that data map is to have the minimum balance. Um, so the clarity code is concerned with making sure that that is all constrained properly so that we don't have denial of service attack, people flooding that map with like, you know, one stacks lockups at a time, um, as well as, of course, making sure that the proper delegation logic works. So I hope to have a PR open for this either today or tomorrow. Um, that also includes determine the recipient sets down here, as well as the rejection window proposal that I'd written up earlier. So all four of these are part of the same PR. Um, Aaron, how are you doing on uh, integrate chains coordinator into stacks node and elsewhere? Um, so making some progress, um, I think that, uh, over the weekend, um, I got blocked a little bit by a couple of regressions in Next, um, but those I think I've taken care of at this point. So Next should be working smoothly again. Um, and then, so at this point, where the integration stands is I have all of the integration tests um, passing with the chains coordinator that do not depend on the event observer um, because the way the event observer previously worked is it was like there was the relayer thread that was also doing all of the chain processing, but because the relayer thread is no longer doing any of the chain processing, um, it can't uh, get the events receipts out to the event observer. Um, so right now I'm just working on moving the event observer um, callbacks into the chains coordinator. Um, and then hopefully, uh, that should be working, um, pretty soon. Um, there are still some hacky bits of the interaction with the chains coordinator and the neon run loop, simply because there's a lot of like parts of the neon run loop that depend on synchronization points, like, um, the Bitcoin reg test controller like needs the sortition to have finished processing before it returns, all sorts of things like that um, that are implemented in a little bit of a hacky way in the current integration um, that I'd like to clean up a little bit. But at this point, it's um, looking pretty good. Like it's mostly just like um, tying up loose ends in this uh, integration, so. I take it most of the systems from the relayer are finding their way into the chain state processor or the chain coordinator. I mean, 
Yeah, pretty much. Um, so like the major thing that the relayer was doing um, that it's no longer doing is like calling chain state dot process blocks. Mm. Um, so now the chains coordinator does that, um, which also actually simplifies the neon node a little bit because um, if you remember, there was this like, there's this event loop in the neon node that we had to like feed with try process attachable events. Yep. Um, in case its event queue was empty. Um, we don't need to do that anymore because the chains coordinator is doing that. Um, awesome. So those are, those are sort of the major, major points where it's sort of taken over. Um, a possible place where there could be some sort of like lagging issues is like um, setting up the unconfirmed state. Um, so previously the neon node after it finished processing a block would call like set up unconfirmed state um, on the chain tip. Um, and it needed the event receipts in order to do that so that it could get the cost up to that point. Yep. Um, the neon node no longer has access to that. So if we wanted to set up the neon nodes um, unconfirmed state using whatever, I, I think that we're going to have to uh, store like alongside each anchor block, store the amount of cost that it used somewhere so that it could pull it out through something other than the event receipts. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I actually considered doing that earlier as part of implementing this and went with the event receipts instead just because I didn't feel like touching five or six different files to make the storage happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it makes sense. Uh, like it was available in the event receipts and they were right there, so yeah. Right, um, but totally open to doing it that way. Um, in fact, cool. it might even be nice just for diagnostic purposes. Yeah. Just to have it all available. Cool. Cool, uh, do you think you're gonna get a PR for that uh, this week sometime? Yeah, um, I mean, it sh should be this week. Like, I know I've been saying this, This <laughs> I've been giving estimates on this PR and they always kind of push back. So I'm a little hesitant to continue providing <laughs> estimates, <laughs> but like things seem to be coalescing. So um, yeah, it, it, at some point it, it depends on like, just like how hacky of um, an interface we run. Because um, like right now, the way that the chains coordinator, like things that depend on the chains coordinator and want to synchronize with it, the way that they're doing it is by basically watching some um, mutex guarded atomics, which are incrementing the number of stacks blocks processed and the number of uh, sortitions processed. Um, we could come up with some interface that used callbacks, which would be sort of more flexible um, going forward. Um, but at the same time, I kind of want to get this into a place where things work and then we can kind of iterate on that. So um, we'll see. Um, qu quick question concerning the event observer moving to the, so you are you basically moving this events dispatcher to do stack scale? Uh, so no, what my plan was is um, to basically just put a trait in the okay. chains coordinator module um, that the event observer from the testnet node would, would implement. Gotcha, okay. Cool. All right, thanks for that update. Um, look forward to reading it. I'm really excited to get the uh, the whole system integrated together into the chains coordinator. Certainly, right now, like what we do with the relayer is and the the two threads in the in the run loop is kind of hacky and uh, doesn't really give you a, a reader a uh, a global view into what's supposed to be happening. Yeah, um, so I would say that in the first in the neon node, like is still functioning in very much the same way. It just like has this additional thread that it's like waiting on. So we're still gonna have all of those threads for right now, but I think that like, if we want to, we can implement like a Xeon node that takes more advantage of the chains coordinator, so. 
should we should we call this the Krypton node instead of the neon node in the code? Or does um, yeah, I I think maybe in the next version because this this version this PR is like fully backwards compatible and like the neon node continues to function in the same way as before. Um, so what we could do is if we want to clean this up, like we could implement a Krypton node um, and then that Krypton node would not have to do all of the current strange things that the neon node does. Got it. Um, but maybe we, I can wait until after we get a first round of uh, review or something. Yeah, I think that that's, that's probably wise just to, just to keep the, uh, the scope of this a, a little bit smaller. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, backlog. Um, add associated chain tip to mempool transactions sent to sidecar. Um, how are you feeling about this one, Ludo? Um, so it's still in backlog. Um, so on Friday, I, I was uh, investigating transactions delays, mm -hmm. which is an issue that Hank has been experiencing last week. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe I can, uh, can take on this one. It's probably more straightforward, like it's not an unknown. Um, so yeah, I can take care of this. Ludo, is there no today. issue for the pending transactions one? That you um, I don't think so. I can open an issue. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Just make a note to do that. All right. Um, these two issues here, the Bitcoin TCP sockets should have a read timeout and a connect timeout. And uh, this test failing intermittently are still backlogged. I don't know if I'll get to them this week, but I'm optimistic um, just because the uh, things I have in progress right here are mostly done. And the things that I still have to do in the new issues aren't um, too big for POX. Um, uh, speaking of new issues, once I send in the PR for the POX lockup, I'll go ahead and take both of these here, the stacking wire format and delegation wire format Bitcoin transactions. Um, processing these is not going to be too different from processing stacks transactions for delegation state and stacks lockup state. Um, it's just a matter of pulling them out of the burn chain database and applying them as if they were contract calls um, before processing the uh, stacks block itself. Um, but otherwise the it, otherwise, like what I can do in this P, what I'll be doing in this PR here um, for the uh, POX smart contract um, is just adding stub methods for um, taking the Bitcoin transactions that I call into the POX contract and putting them into the block processing loop so you'll know where they'll go. And then I'll follow that up with a PR that does both of these two issues right here. And I expect to have that done this week. Um, insofar as the rest of these issues, um, I believe I can get this issue here done. The uh, retain invalid blocks for use in chain replay diagnostics. That's not too big of an ask. Um, just a matter of making sure these higher priority tasks are done first. Um, the micro block work, I, this is a stretch goal for me. I don't think I'm going to reach it this week. Um, enforcing a 10 minute timeout on all tests. I haven't, I've been looking into ways to do this. I haven't found a uh, clean way of doing it. And by clean, I mean, find a way to do it that doesn't involve uh, tweaking all of the tests for which this is a problem. Um, for example, by that, I mean like wrapping them in a, in a closure and saying like abort after 10 seconds, but I'll keep looking. Um, but it's not, I don't consider it to be as high a priority as the POX work. Cool. Yeah, I mean, Something like a, um, just like a function decorator, like a I, macro. I, yeah, I did look into that. A, uh, yeah. The problem with that though, is that you have to make that in a wholly separate crate. Oh, I see. Yeah, they don't let you do it in the same crate. Gotcha. That was my first thought. Like, but I, I can do that. I can publish a block stack crate that just decorates the test and says like abort after 10 minutes. I see. What about just like a net test macro? So rather than a uh, yeah, that's doable. Um, yeah, I guess like the question is of scope because I know that there are other tests that take longer than ten minutes or that we ignore right now. For example, 
or do you, like the MARF tests, for example, do we do we not consider those to be in scope for this timeout? I don't think so. Like the MARF tests, like they don't have this property that they have an indefinite runtime. Like a, a MARF test, like will never run for three hours. True. True. Okay, that makes this a lot more, um, a lot less painful then, um, because yeah. I can just implement a callback for the just network tests. Cool. Awesome. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, clear the milestone here and switch over to new issues. <clears throat> So we got this PR from Pascal last week, and it looks good to me. Uh, if anyone else wants to review it, um, please feel free to do so. But I asked him to wait to merge until Aaron sent his PR that fixed the uh, uh, Bitcoin D test, GitHub action test. Um, all it does is it makes it so that the um, you can set the download interval, like how, how often the node wakes up to download blocks, um, as well as um, what the node's public IP address and a few other goodies here uh, via the config file. So once he once he pulls in on master, I can just go ahead and merge this if no one else wants to take a look. All right, um, this issue here, regression in neon node rs. I think this is Aaron. This is your PR, right? Yeah, this this can be closed. Cool, because um, I think I merged the PR. Yeah. All right, um, we got this issue that Pascal had also reported about the uh, miners only mining every other block. Um, this is related to the issue that he had opened earlier, um, whereby he increases, as I decreases the amount of time spent between block downloads, and it seems to have made a difference. Uh, but there is a uh, another interesting point that came up here. Um, one of the reasons why we see these long delays between mining blocks is because the UTXO scan size for a mining address can get really big, like on the order of a megabyte of JavaScript returned towards yeah. the end of the uh, testnet run. Yeah, And so it can take on the order of 10 seconds to get a reply. Um, one way we, there's a few ways we can address this. I, just out of <laughs> Um, first issue, first way we could address this is we can make it so that the uh, mining code just remembers the set of UTXOs it produced. So it doesn't have to ask the Bitcoin node each time and it doesn't have to ask the uh, Bitcoin node to rescan its UTXO set. Um, another concurrent issue that we already have open in 1615 here is this idea that we drop the need to send a uh, leader public key registration transaction for each block commit. And I think we I think we convinced ourselves a while back that that was safe to do. Um, it's just we haven't gotten around to implementing it yet. Does that yeah. sound consistent? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think like getting rid of that requirement for VR public keys um, will help just across so many different things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because it, it's also like uh, a lot, some of the flakiness of the minor behavior has to do with like maintaining its set of VRF keys and like keeping yeah. it up to date. Um, so let's just go ahead and uh, put this into the next milestone then. Yeah. I don't think, I don't have time to work on it this milestone, um, but. And I don't think anyone else does, but speak up if you do. Otherwise, we can just take this on next Monday. Cool. Cool. All right. The thread panic. I believe this is fixed in uh, master. Um, it was fixed by pull request 1774. That was the uh, the raciness that can show up between an indexed commit and say a side store commit. Um, uh, I don't believe we've seen any more instances of this as of uh, the current deployment, um, which is consistent with this uh, this commit right here to master. Cool. Um, but I think there is one little ask that I can take care of this week. 
um, from Charlie and matches to print out the, uh, the Simber version to standard out when the node boots up. So I can just go ahead and take that. Yep. And feel free to rename or reword this issue. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, create GitHub action workflow to build release stacks blockchain assets. This is like a uh, discussion issue. Okay. Yeah, so some context here is that um, the DevOps team has put together, you know, a bunch of useful GitHub actions that we can use in whatever projects need to do automated versioning. So if you follow the commitment sort of convention to format your commit messages, uh, then for every commit that merges into master, uh, it will automatically trigger, you know, a major version release or a minor version release. So it's obviously useful in the context of let's say SDKs or libraries um, to the extent that we could or want to have any sort of release automation for uh, the Saks blockchain repo, this issue is basically saying, you know, the DevOps team and those actions can be helpful. I think that we need to discuss within the team, like what sort of automation, if any, do we want around releases? I mean, at a high level, I think it's a good idea to version each release. Um, I guess the question then becomes like, um, to what extent do we feel it's safe to do this using SEMVAR? Because um, you could imagine like, so I mean, if all we need is like a, 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 a tag that distinguishes release build, like master merge from master merge, then I, I think the uh, um, short hash of the master branch is sufficient for this. Um, but if we want to, uh, I'd feel less comfortable doing something like automatically bumping a minor version or, or worse, bumping a major version every time because that, that's like an abuse of Sember to me. I mean, so Sember um, sort of has some solutions for this. So like what our, if, if what our Sembar was, was like our major was zero, um, what Sember does is it treats every release, minor or patch, um, as a breaking change um, because you're in alpha and basically anything goes. Um, so what we could do for now is declare our version 0 .0 0.0.1, um, which is what our cargo.toml file does. And if we wanted to, what that would do is make every merge to master bump the patch version and then we could have something along those lines. Um, I think that version version numbering does have some advantages over just a commit hash um, because yeah, it, it conveys ordering. Ordering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, I totally buy that. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, the, the trap I don't want us to fall into is like, you know, doing what like system D or what X term, or I think Emacs does this too, is we're just like, okay, new release, just give it a whole new major version number and do it automatically. So we're at version 10,000, you know, a year from now. Right. Um, so presumably when we do the release, like uh, when mainnet launches, like major versions would only connote hard forks. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, this isn't particularly urgent to address. I think yeah. it is useful to articulate our requirements and needs. Um, so to the extent that you have thoughts and opinions, uh, what should be requirements, just feel free to add comments uh, in the docs so we at least have a collection. And then once like it's clear, we converge on a set of things that we want to see happen, uh, then the DevOps team can help with the automation. Cool. Let's go ahead and do that async then. Add that as our to-do. All right, cool. This is in progress. Um, so this you is in review. Sorry, yes, my bad, in review. Um, this we already talked about. Let's see. 
And I think that, um, Aaron, can we close this now? Is this merged? We're running the test net, Bitcoin D regression yeah. test in HPR? Yep. Cool. Um, in light of uh, the discoveries that Pascal's been making, should this be bumped up? Should we start tracking the block download rate in the peer-to-peer -peer networking code? I know we will need to do this for POX at some point in order to uh, make sure we process the anchor blocks. Uh, maybe maybe next next sprint. Yeah. Sounds good. Minor stars to really, I think we talked about this last week. All right, cool. Everything good here on issues? Oops. So um, test net check-in, I guess we skipped that by mistake. I think the panic is fixed, mentioned that earlier. Um, mining throughput. If there's no objections, I'll merge in the, the changes Pascal made. And that should, uh, according to his own findings, that significantly cuts down on the forking combined with Aaron's PR. That should, uh, that should improve our block throughput potentially twofold. Um, mining bug fix. I'm trying to remember what this was. This was, um, yeah, this was Aaron's PR. And we just, uh, that, that just got merged. Um, do we want to talk about because POX is going to become a thing in the next couple of weeks, do we want to talk about how this will affect the miner? Because the miner will need to um, be aware to some extent about um, what POX fork it's on, or or maybe it won't have to think very really hard about anything. Um, yeah, so the hope would be that the POX miner wouldn't really have to think too hard about anything. Um, so there is this function in sortition db that was like get canonical burn chain tip um, that I originally thought we were going to have to um, remove essentially to support um, POX, um, but actually we we don't have to. Um, like we can maintain that in in POX just relying on the chains coordinator to like invalidate all of the sortitions that it's sort of forking away from. Um, and so because of that, the miner can just call whatever the chain tip is. Like the miner, given the database, uh, database reference, it can just find whatever the canonical tip should be and start mining off of that. So it shouldn't need to be aware of any POX forks. Awesome. Just that I'd like to hear. <laughs> Not having to pack on the miner. <laughs> yes. Uh, quick question concerning the, um, and it's maybe not for this team, but maybe for the worker. Um, so are we planning to augment the explorer in any way to like reflect the, um, like I, I think at some point we, we want to show some changes in the Explorer for POX. Are we planning to do a new pass on the Explorer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so if you have ideas or suggestions on what should be relevant or should be done, feel free to send them to Alex. There is a planning meeting on, uh, let's see, this coming Wednesday. Uh, but yes, I, I think we plan to keep the Explorer updated and make any improvements or additions um, as they make sense for uh, creating more visibility and transparency around POX and stacking. Sounds good. We may need to think a little bit about the uh, transaction receipts that we send over, for example, like at a minimum, we might want to say, hey, this is an anchor block or there is no anchor block in this uh, reward cycle, or this is the reward cycle ID for this this block I'm sending you information about, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just telling Alex things. It's, it's also us figuring out the kinds of things we need to be sending um, the, the, uh, the sidecar. OK. 
Okay, moving on to uh, testnet timelines. Um, I updated the green stuff for myself here. I'm extending the determined recipient set and stacks lockup state to a couple more days just so I can finish testing. Um, but these are both part of the same uh, clarity contract. Um, once this is done, I intend to get the uh, stacking wire format uh, for Bitcoin transactions finished and implemented and integrated into the test framework as well to ensure that you can uh, do POX or POX delegation via Bitcoin transactions. Um, and that should be done by the end of this week. And then uh, next week comes my work on the uh, networking changes to make um, blocks, sorry, to make nodes talk to each other even when they are on different POX forks, um, as well as uh, the beginning the relevant integration work. Uh, I see that uh, we got sortition using recipients bumped up here. Um, that should be unblocked by this PR, hopefully, so I won't be holding you back any longer, Ludo. Uh, wait, is it I think me? that's going to be on my plate. Oh, yeah. okay. I th thought for a second that Ludo was the orange. Hmm. I don't know what these colors denote anymore. <laughs> I, I think back when, were... I, back when I first created them, the colors and the rows were kind of redundant information for for peoples uh, and sort of bandwidth. But uh, I think since then, things have kind of gotten um, maybe more complex. Yeah, but now we have four, four, <laughs> four I don't know people. how to read this anymore. <laughs> um, cool, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just bumping that over. So the change coordinator, it, it's far, continues to expand. And then, uh, uh, once I wrapped up the chains coordinator um, integration, I can get started on the um, recipient set, set stuff. Um, so, so Aaron, what I can do for you is I can give you a method as part of my PR that you just call to get the list of POX addresses and how much stacks are stacked on them at a given block height. Does that sound reasonable to you? Yeah, that's um, that should be great. Um, yeah, the so. Basically, then the only work to be done, I think, would be in iterating over the recipient set during a reward cycle. Um, yeah, and doing the permutation on it using the VRF seed and updating yeah. the block commit transaction. Yep. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Ludo. What were you saying? Um, so I was wondering about the purple uh, line. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Is that part of something you're doing uh, as well? Or? Yeah. So um, I guess the question here. So uh, the stacks lockup state is not doing anchor block detection, right? Like it just yeah. is pulling that information. Yeah. So. Um, that is something that that needs to be um, implemented, but that should also be pretty quick. So what I can do is just bump that down here, grab that, and then something like that is what it looks like. Okay. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long the anchor block detection will actually end up taking. Um, I think that code is relatively straightforward. Um, we'll yeah. See. You're just scanning over the sortitions that happened in a fixed um, burn chain window and seeing if any of them reach 80% support, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, and I think um, I actually already have a little bit of code hiding in some branch somewhere um, that does this, so should be off to a good start there. Sweet. Um, integration testing of anchorless implementation is that kind of where we are right now? As part yeah, of the I think that that's that's actually where we are right now. So perhaps, uh, yeah, we can we can backdate this. Yeah, here we go. So this was about midday Friday. <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> there we go. That's where we are. Cool. Um, just going through the uh, work items here. I think that this is all reflected up here, right? So we don't need to think too hard about 
layer th the third phase items? Yeah, I think that that's the case. Um, and then for the networking logic, um, yeah. this is uh, this actually is changing much less than we initially thought, right? I think the um, so the the semantic meaning of the consensus hash has changed. So that so there there will need to be an update to the way in which we uh, authenticate preambles and do handshakes. Yeah. Um, so like nodes that have different consensus hashes, but the same burn chain hash can still talk to each other. And that's going to be a breaking change to the handshake wire format. I see. That's okay though. Like we'll just, we'll coordinate a flag day and say, Hey, everyone upgrade your nodes or they're not going to be able to talk. Yeah. Um, cool. I haven't thought hard enough about this yet. I don't know how big of a change it is, but I, I have a hunch that in terms of just sheer lines of code to review, it's probably, I stand by what I said here, it's probably going to be a medium sized pull request. Okay. Um, but it's, but before we can even think about testing this, that we need to be able to think about, we need to be able to create unhappy pads like POX forks and such. Yeah. Um, is that something that's happening as part of your work, Aaron? Um, so currently the code couldn't create a POX fork, um, but like in testing, you probably would be able to. Um, basically, it's just like got this one function for detecting an anchor block that's currently stubbed that always returns either like you're not at the start of a reward cycle or if you are at the start of a reward cycle, it always returns that there was no anchor block chosen. Gotcha. Um, so like we could actually, if we wanted to test the POX fork handling, uh, just have that function return that an anchor block was chosen um, and that like it wasn't present. So um, yeah. Yeah, like the way that the networking test framework uh, works right now, for example, is you, you could just make it so that uh, that particular, like no anchor blocks ever get discovered during the registration period or something like that. Right. Um, where was I gonna go with this? Um, so what, what that would mean though, is that like, it, it's almost like the networking code should not even be that aware of POX because all the networking code really should care about is like trying to maximize the number of blocks the node has. And then the node from there figures out how to interpret them as being on a particular POX fork. Yeah, exactly. The like the one thing that we would want to do to ensure that the network uh, retains like high good put is that like you wouldn't want the network to continue propagating blocks on forks that will never be. Um, yes. Canonical. So I think then a big part of the uh, uh, refactor for the block inventory logic is being able to request an inventory um, given a particular anchor block. Yeah. So that way, like, you know, different burn blocks will have different uh, blocks present in them, depending yeah. on which anchor block or the absence of which anchor block you pick. So that would take a consensus hash. Because that can tell you like what POX fork you're asking for the next reward cycles blocks on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that for the networking code, like the POX bit vector is something that would probably be pretty useful. Um, is the POX bit vector, unlike a consensus hash, tells you. Um, which portion of the blocks you share the same view of. Yeah, so the block inventory sync would now be a two-step process. You would first get the POX vector, and then from there, uh, for each POX bit set, you would get the reward cycle P um, block vector. Yeah. Um, regarding testing, is there, in, in the design of your code, um, one thing that I've done in my own tests is made it so that if we're testing certain uh, periods of time, like minor maturity, for example, is considerably shorter than it would be in production, just so the tests don't take, you know, 30 minutes to run. Yeah, um, so that is, it's configurable, like it's actually, it's passed in through the burn chain object. 
Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. So we can do like a reward cycle that's 10 blocks long or something like that. Exactly. Cool. That's, that's going to make things a lot less painful. Anything else for uh, phase three that we want to talk about? Not a discussion topic, but mostly an FII. If you all recall, we still have the phase three also of our security audits uh, to go through, which has been kind of waiting on the completion of the POX implementation. So uh, I have tentatively set the expectation that we will be able to move forward with those security audits in the first week of September. Um, and, you know, as Hopefully that'll, that gives us enough time to finish the implementation, but if that changes, we'll adjust the dates. Sounds good. Um, for phase four, uh, regarding the Stacks 1.0 import, I kind of already added some stub code for this um, that I'm including with the POXPR because it affects the uh, measure of how we uh, determine the total number of liquid stacks. Um, and that in turn affects um, who can register a POX address in a reward cycle. Um, the way that I tentatively have this written is every time we process a stacks block, just like how in stacks 1.0 it works, we look at a table, a read only table, and then we see, we, then for, in that table, we look up the current block height and then we see who gets, who gets new stacks at that block. And then we just process those as uh, stack grants or stack materializations. Um, that's largely going to be the same, I think, in Stacks 2.0, um, but we'll have a separate contract for it in the boot code that includes a set of methods that um, the Stacks node can call itself to iterate over the list of uh, addresses and token values that will be granted at that particular block height. And then we'll have a, uh, that boot code will also contain a gigantic data map inside of it that just encodes that information, roughly how the Genesis block file uh, encodes this information in the Stacks 1.0 code base. Um, before I proceed further on this, though, does that sound reasonable to everyone? Yeah, it sounds like a reasonable strategy to me. Um, so that's like the. Oh, I'm on now. That's I would guess I would call that Sorry, the stacks um, 1.0 import of stacks holdings because um, it's somewhat separate from. Uh, naming all of the naming system. Yeah, BNS. Agreed. Um, so we're tracking uh, Clarity features in this uh, repo right here, right? Clarity Lang? Yeah. Uh, do we have a list of features that will make it into the uh, main net launch? Is that tracked somewhere in this project? Or is um, that so there's like a tag that's like, priority high or something or like should be included in mainnet. Uh, right now there's only one thing tagged with that. Um, mm -hmm. what, which, which is that that we don't have yet? Um, it's the crypto operations for signature verification. Um, I see. That's it. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that's like, uh, that seems like a feature that um, if we don't have, uh, will severely limit the usefulness of Clarity. Can I, um, can I add some issues that I'd let that I think need to be in place by mainnet? Yeah, sure. Start adding issues. It cool. is a, it is a open issue board. Excellent. Um, I, I, I've already kind of started this, but I haven't really taken any action of like making it so that Clarity can, uh, pull up uh, burn chain block hashes so we can do things later like parse burn chain headers and report information like that um, in order to do things like verify that Bitcoin payments have taken place. Yeah, um, so we might just want to like throw all that in one issue like a provide burn chain like interface or something. Yeah, I can go ahead and flesh that out. Uh, and so, so we have all these issues in the Clarity repo. Uh, who is going to decide what is uh, what are the features that will make it to mainnet, and yeah, what what's the what's the plan for that? 
Um, I mean, the, the short answer is, you know, based on the input we get from the community, uh, our community, the Sachs Foundation and PBC input, you know, essentially this group can collectively choose uh, what we want to block mainnet for. Um, I think there is a related discussion around, um, you know, at least in my mind, in terms of prioritization, um, sort of POX um, and the upgrade path, like all of those things uh, are a little bit higher priority in preparation for a mainnet. Um, and so we can do two things, you know, sort of explore in parallel other ways of making forward progress on clarity issues. Uh, and then the other thing we talked briefly about last week was sort of contemplating whether we should preset a future date at which we will introduce, you know, some clarity features that don't make it um, for the, some initial mainnet launch. And, do we want to do that? If we do, what time frame? What cadence? And I think Judy had suggested that you know this is a good topic for uh, the governance working group. Um, and so, so I, you know, I would say we should open up the conversation um, and and hear from folks on if if there are sort of opinions one way or the other. I think that this would actually be a great way to vet the SIP process. So if someone wants to start writing a SIP that um, codifies the mechanism by which um, new clarity features will be added through a hard fork, um, that would be something we can send off to the governance working group and we can actually get it all ratified and approved. So at least that way we all know it's coming and um, we have a way of determining that the, whether or not the community wants it. Um, Dewalker, do you want to take that or should we delegate that to one of the three of us? Um. I don't know if I personally will have the time, but at the same time, I don't know that either of the three of you should do that. Let me <laughs> float this with uh, some other clarity members. Maybe someone from Algorand wants to take a stab uh, at it. Uh, so, so let me try to find someone else who can maybe give it a first crack. Yeah, that would be great. Cause then we can start training that muscle. Cause this is very much, cause anything that involves forking is going to be a governance process. Um, I did go and add uh, one thing here as a large item, and that is porting the uh, um, registrar and the off-chain naming system to Blockstack Stacks 2.0. Um, I consider these both part of the same, two sides of the same coin here, but ideally the subdomain registrar doesn't change too, too much, um, really just the transaction format. Um, I, th I think porting it isn't going to be too bad. It, it's just a lot of code is all because the subdomain system is pretty big in Stacks 1.0, um, but we already know how it's supposed to work. Is and, this all uh, Python code, Jude? Um, the, just the subdomains.py file really is what needs to be ported. We already have the Atlas network um, ported over in the form of the current peer-to-peer -peer network. And in fact, we could just make the uh, zone file propagation system um, piggyback on top of it, just via the HTTP interface even. Okay. Um, I'm happy to take that on. I don't think it's, I don't think it's particularly time consuming. I'm not expecting, expecting any unknown, unknown surprises. Um, just a matter of setting the side, time aside to make it happen and do the port. Happy to take on this if you want to delegate or something. Which one, the thing that DeWalker just typed here or the uh, subdomain system port? The, the port, yeah. Okay, yeah. Whoever gets to it first. Um, Aaron, do you have any insights on this issue DeWalker just added here? Determine the real constants for clarity runtime costs? Because I know that's something you said that you wanted to uh, develop a test harness for at some point. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you yeah, added it, by the way. Yeah, I, I added it. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, the in, in a perfect world, like what this would entail is like um, a benchmarking harness that like you could run on your computer. Um, maybe it would take like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, but it would spit, spit out relative uh, runtime constants um, for various clarity um, functions. Um, and then based on those relative constants, um, at that point we can use those to determine a block limit given a target 
um, block compute time. So if we're targeting, you know, that a block should always be computable in like under a minute or what have you, mm -hmm. um, we will be able to set that um, based off of those those relative uh, constants. How um how do you? Uh, I, I'm really curious to know how you uh, intend to sample this because depending on a lot of things that are like not even seemingly related, like you know your VM cache write back or the particular file system you're using or even the type of hard drive you're using, you might get numbers that vary by a factor of ten or more. Yeah. Well, so the clarity runtime constants um, shouldn't depend on the hard drive at all. Okay. Um, so the runtime constants would only be for functions that are not like these are all the native functions um, and they would be only the functions that do not perform any MARF accesses. Um, so it's establishing runtime costs for those. Um, and the way that that would work is, yeah, I mean, in, in different platforms, you would see different um, relationships between these things, um, which is why you want to set up a test harness so that you can run it on a handful of different platforms. For sure. Um, and then in terms of things like VM caches, all sorts of um, nasties like that, um, you set up a benchmark harness that uh, does these things in a tight loop so that um, you sort of can factor out any caching effects. Do we, um, how, I guess like my next question would be how much consideration then do we want to uh, place on things like disk seek times or things that will have like wildly different um, absolute times to take? Uh, right. Like an SSD, yeah. for example, is probably not going to notice much MARF pain at all, but a spinning Rust disk definitely will. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, pretty much everything experiences MARF pain. Um, like uh, a, a, a MARF read is probably a hundred to a thousand times more expensive than any other single clarity operation. Um, like you could probably do, like if we implement signature verification. Um, you could probably do a hundred signature verifications in the time that you could do a MARF read. I see. Um, that makes sense. I mean, that's just, yeah. the, the disk path is going to be slow and certainly you do a lot of disk accesses for read. Right. Um, so I think like when it comes to determining a limit for reads and writes, um, for MARF reads and writes, um, that's a limit that we're going to need to set through benchmarking the MARF on various platforms. Because that also impacts um, stacks, just stacks transfers. Stacks transfers to a handful of reads. Um, and so that'll be informative about what our block limits should be. Right, because our block limits have uh, IO as a, as a dimension for, uh, as, part, as one of the dimensions of the limit. Yeah. Um, so, for example, like if we build up a full block, like a two megabyte block with stacks transfers, um, just the MARF uh, accesses of that two megabyte block um, could be surprisingly large. Like, and it would be like an informative uh, data point for us for setting the limit um, for the Clarity VM as well. True. Um, regarding this, in light, in light of your expectation that uh, um, MARF accesses can be a hundred to a thousand X slower than most clarity operations, do we want to uh, consider some optimization engineering or at least do a pass of that before we uh, pick our constants? Um, so I think that uh, definitely we would want to do some optimization at least before mainnet. Um, ultimately, I think when it comes to the picking of these constants, like if we set up a harness for determining these things, um, ideally, like what that means is that we've done the hard work and if we perform optimizations, if we can run this harness again and determine new constants. 
Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like we, we set some time aside to run the benchmark, iterate on the engineering, run the benchmark again, et cetera, and try to get the numbers better. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other uh, concern related to this is that um, we have uh, a handful of operations and language features um, that uh, our implementation does not conform to like the theoretical runtime bounds that those operations could have. Um, so like things like function calls, we do type checks on all of the arguments, um, even when the type checker has already sort of done that work. Um, and so every time we do a function call, um, we are bearing this cost of doing these type checks, um, which in theory we wouldn't need to do, but in practice, our implementation does. I see. Um, and that's a problem for block limits because what that means is like, Either we have to say, we're going to charge for these. Um, and then even in the future, if we improve the node software, like it would require a hard fork to actually um, pay those costs forward. Um, or we say, we're not going to charge our VM for this. Um, and then we're potentially in a situation where we're doing expensive things that we're not necessarily charging people for. Right. Um, yeah, I, I see your point there. I, I, I'm philosophically inclined right now to take the latter option and just bank on Moore's law helping us, but that's, yeah, it's risky to do that though. Yeah, yeah. I agree. That's like where I'm leaning to. Um, but that's al it's also like a DDoS vector. Like if someone can yes. find a way to make that really bad, then. Right, right. So like the, the worry that I have is just that like, if we do this, we, we basically just need to make sure that like at, at a minimum, this isn't a DDoS vector. Yes, very much so. Um, we could do some. Uh, oh, never mind. Different topic. Yeah. Um, um, so there's like a just basically like a whole bundle, I guess, of issues and topics basically related to um, setting our block costs. Can we? Is that, I think the moral here. Do you do you mind taking like just a few minutes and uh, writing up on the the obvious optimizations we should make that we should do before maintenance? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll do that. Uh, I think that there's I have a couple open issues. I think um, unless they've been closed by the sale bot, but um, yeah, I'll put, try to put some of them together. Um, uh, one final question on this from me. I, I know that just watching the community discord, there's several people, I think, including Dan, who's on this call that run uh, the stacks node on raspberry Pis. I think maybe we should consider um, using that as part of our uh, canonical supported hardware. Uh, sure, but which raspberry Pi? Uh, I would just go with the latest. Okay. Four. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll, you might find that those are surprisingly powerful. I don't know. Those yeah, those but they're, they're only going to get more powerful as time yeah, goes yeah. on, though. That's true. Like, I have a Raspberry Pi 2 that can't even run modern Linux anymore because it, it's like the pre-hard uh, float ARM chip or whatever, 32-bit, so it's not even getting support in a lot of cases. I see. Again, I'm not worried about supporting that, for example. That's, yeah, I don't even think they make those anymore. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, I'm um, so... <laughs> Uh, glad, like if, if I can provide some support on this one, I'm also happy to do it. Awesome. Um, we're almost at time here. Um, do we want to actually we're a little bit over? Um, is there anything else for um, phase four here that we want to talk about? Like these two things, testnet and mainnet compatibility, I don't think are going to be that big. It's just a matter of like, do they work or do they not work? But what we're doing right now with reg tests is not too big of a leap to do on testnet, for example. Yeah, I think there's just a little bit of work that's going to go into building, uh, getting the minor and run loop set up. To yeah. Communicate with the testnet node. Yeah. 
I should add a separate thing for that. Um, yeah. Uh, I expect that the trickiest thing will just be providing UTXOs. Like, I don't know. Are we going to run a UTXO provider for testnet for random community members to be querying? Well, if we can make it so that uh, the miner just remembers his UTXO set, um, then all you would really need to do is just make sure that you have the uh, initial UTXO, i.e. the first transaction you use to fund your miner. I see. Because unlike Stacks 1.0, Stacks 2.0 doesn't care about prior UTXOs. It doesn't need the TX index feature. Gotcha. That was a deliberate design decision because that's such a pain in the ass to do. Yes. Um, that is a design decision that you will uh, need to deal with in the wire format for stacking. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, cool. All right, awesome. Um, so, any more questions? No? Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Awesome. Cool. Have a good week, everyone. Yep. Adios. Uh,